hear me? Yes, you can start. Good morning. Good morning, good afternoon, good day, depending upon where you are mm -hmm. participating from. I am, my name is Muni Muni Appen. I am one of the co-hosts of this webinar. My job title is Director of Integrated Waste Management Innovation Lab, a program funded by USAID. The term integrated waste management was coined by the entomologists at the University of California in the 1960s when they found chemical pesticides like DDT causing pesticide resistance, pest resurgence, adverse impact on the environment and human health and also on non-target species. In 1993, USAID decided to start integrated pest management program for the developing countries. So it asked the US universities to bid for it and Virginia Tech did and it was successful in securing it. So Virginia Tech has been managing this program for the past 27 years. In the past, Virginia Tech uh, managed IPM Innovation Lab activities in 30 different countries, but currently it is operating only in seven countries. They are Bangladesh, Cambodia, Nepal, Vietnam in Asia, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Tanzania in Africa. In the IPM Innovation Lab, we develop IPM packages for the current waste problems. What we mean by IPM packages, we develop non-chemical pesticide technologies for problems faced by the farmers from the time of planting seeds to the harvest and stack them into a package and give it to the scientists, and scientists, extension agents, and the value chain programs in the developing countries to implement them in the farmers' fields. Even though we do not recommend use of chemical pesticides in all cases, but we do recommend whenever there are no non-chemical pesticide technologies uh, available. Since DDT was introduced in the 1940s, several safer pesticide molecules have been introduced in the market. Pesticide in general contributed tremendously to the increased crop production. However, the term pesticide means pest killer. We have to be careful in using them, otherwise we will cause harm to, the, harm to our health and environment. The IPM Innovation Lab is very pleased to co-organize this webinar, Safe Use of Pesticides, with CNFA to address these problems. Now I invite Dr. Marjeta Elita, Director of Farmer to Farmer Program of CNA, to welcome the participants and to introduce the speaker. Marjeta, please. Thank you very much. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, wherever you might be. And uh, thank you very much for being here for this important uh, webinar. My name is Marietta Elita, and I am the program director for the USAID funded Southern Africa Farmer to Farmer program. As mentioned, I work for CNFA, which has been implementing farmer-to-farmer -farmer programs almost uh, 30 years. And farmer-to-farmer -farmer program is a volunteer program that sends expert volunteers for short-term assignments in developing countries. During their assignments, the volunteers work with farmer organizations, small and medium agribusinesses, agricultural universities or agricultural schools, uh, or agricultural ministries uh, to provide technical support and training. The Southern Africa Farmer to Farmer program covers five countries in the region, Madagascar, Malawi, Mozambique, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. 
across these countries, unsafe use of pesticides endangers health and lives of farmers, their family members, and consumers. Much can be done through training to educate the farmers and their families of the dangers that unsafe practices pose to them and to the buyers of their products. So we are therefore very pleased to have this collaboration with the IPM Innovation Lab to extend the messages about the ways in which pesticides should be handled and uh, stored and applied in the context of the integrated pest management practices. And this, we hope that this collaboration with the IPM Innovation Lab is only the first of many uh, collaborative activities as we really see that there's a lot that the Farmer to Farmer program can do together with the innovation labs to extend the innovations, the technologies, the practices that these innovation labs have developed. And today we are very fortunate to have with us uh, Mr. Tim McCoy, who is an extension associate at the Virginia uh, Tech Pesticides Programs and has decades of experience in conducting extension efforts on pesticides. And today's uh, training is the part one of a two-part uh, training. The second part will be on November 12th. And uh, we really look forward to learning from Tim about pesticide uh, uh, use pesticide uh, handling, pesticide storage safe, in a safe way so that you know, each of us in our work can take those messages further uh, for the benefit uh, of our farmers and their families and uh, consumers in the countries where we work. So without further ado, I will hand this over now to Tim. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mariana, and thank you, Mooney, uh, for the introduction. I want to thank you all for uh, taking your time to join me, us, this morning, and uh, thank CNFA and uh, the Farmer to Farmer program for making this possible. It's an honor to uh, volunteer my time to help spread uh, the pesticide safety message. Um, I'm going to share my screen now so that we can see my presentation. So. Uh, and the first slide that should come up um, is what we're going to be doing in this uh, presentation is I'll be giving two uh, presentations uh, separated by a question and answer session. You can answer, you can ask a question at any time uh, by typing your question into the chat box. We have uh, someone will be monitoring the questions and then during the Q&A, uh, they'll be asking those questions. Also during the Q&A, if you want to ask a question verbally, you can just raise your hand and uh, the host will unmute you and you can speak directly uh, to me. Okay, um, let's see, let me do this. All right. Uh, yes, and I think then uh, we will get started. Oops, let's see. There we are. Okay. Well, my philosophy uh, with teaching pesticide uh, safety is to look at the balancing of risks. We, as humans, we're balancing risks every day. We take risks when we leave our homes uh, and get in our cars and go to work. And so we're, we're constantly balancing risks. With pesticide safety, it's particularly important uh, because we're dealing with chemicals uh, that it is right in their name. They're designed to kill something and uh, that they may increase the risk to us. Um, farmers understand balancing risks and balancing risks means balancing costs. Um, so they're balancing the benefit, potential benefit of increasing the yield in their crop with the cost of the pesticide that they may be purchasing. If the 
benefit of using a pesticide isn't going to be greater yield, there's no, there may be no point in, in making that chemical intervention. So farmers are aware of those uh, cost benefit analyses right up front. The other uh, balancing act that they have to perform, and sometimes they don't, uh, it's not as conscious and in the forefront of their mind, is balancing the benefit of controlling the pest that is harming their crop with the risk of pesticide exposure, either to them, their, their land, their livestock, their environment, their family. And so I think one of the goals of pesticide safety is helping people understand that they need to think about those risks as well and factor them into their other risk calculations. Now, when I talk to my audiences, I like to emphasize that the reasons for studying pesticide safety, and the most important one is that the farmer, that individual applying, using and applying pesticides, they're important to someone. They're someone's family member, and they want to return home safely and be able to farm for as long as they choose to do so. They're often using highly concentrated pesticides that have increased risks when they're handling them. And so it's, it's vital that they understand the risks associated with those chemicals. Uh, and they want to protect not only their family's future, but their land and their environment for the, the prosperity of uh, their, their country and their family. So I try to drive that message, but it's ideally, they're the most important person in the equation and understanding those risks, how they affect them personally. I also like to emphasize that as the individual, the farmer has goal, uh, the opportunity to minimize pesticide exposure through the entire use chain of a pesticide. They can't necessarily eliminate all risks, but they can minimize the exposure risks in each portion of the pesticide use chain, whether it be from pesticide, what they choose to buy, where and when they buy it, uh, how they mix and load it, uh, the app during application, during cleanup, storage and disposal. And I'm gonna talk about each of these uh, topics. In today's presentation, we're just going to be able to get through to the mixing and loading. The second presentation will be on application through storage and disposal. And all of this starts with emphasizing integrated pest management. Integrated pest management is a uh, tactical uh, approach that minimizes the need for chemical uh, interventions. Uh, it relies on cultural, mechanical, biological controls, and but chemical interventions are part of it. It's just that we want to use the least toxic and most effective pesticide at the point where it will be most effective so that overall we can minimize the exposure to uh, the farmers and the environment. Now, uh, IPM is a balanced approach. I like to analogize it to a band playing together that everyone has their part to play and hopefully it comes together in a, a beautiful symphony. Um, it protects you, it protects the environment. It, and it relies heavily on identification of the pest, measuring how much damage that pest is doing, and then making decisions about if that level of damage is sufficient to warrant a uh, intervention. Sometimes it's not, uh, it can just be left alone. Uh, IPM anticipates and prevents problems before they become catastrophic. And it uses several tactics together so that you can, if you need to rely on chemical intervention, you can uh, use the least toxic uh, solution. Now, key to uh, understanding the risks associated with pesticides is understanding how the pesticides can affect uh, the applicator himself. And so I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about the effects of pesticides on applicators and how to recognize them and uh, reduce them. Now the routes of exposure for pesticides uh, come in the form of inhalation, breathing in the pesticides, oral, ingesting the pesticides, or a dermal exposure that absorbing it through the skin, and this includes ocular exposure, getting it into your eyes. Now, 
this uh, is just a repeat of that uh, for your use. The skin exposure uh, is usually the most common uh, form of exposure because when you're working with either the concentrate uh, of the pesticide or the dilute form, the possibility of it being spilled on your skin or getting splashed on you is that's the greatest uh, risk. And this chart shows uh, the comparative portions of your body and how absorptive they are to different pesticides or to pesticides in general. Uh, the forearm is used as the standard, um, as a one. You can by that you can see that uh, the palms of your hands hands are a little bit more absorptive, uh, but you can also see that uh, the forehead is much more absorptive, about four times the forearm. And you can imagine if you're working, uh, you get uh, a pesticide either from the, the concentrate or the application on your hand and you mop your sweaty brow, that's a, your forehead is much more absorptive. Likewise, the abdomen and the uh, groin area are much more absorptive. Any place where there's high vascular uh, content, where the blood and the skin, uh, there's a lot of blood vessels, you can absorb a lot of pesticides. So you can imagine if you were to be working with a concentrated pesticide and spill it in during the mixing, spill it on your chest and down onto your lap, you could absorb quite a bit of uh, the, the chemical. Um, the other way that uh, you're absorbing it is during spills, splashes, and drift or wiping into your eyes. This can occur during the, uh, the application if there's a wind shift and it's blown back onto your skin. And that's uh, one of the reasons why personal protective equipment is so important, uh, wearing glasses, uh, gloves, coveralls, and boots. Um, your eyes are extremely absorptive. And not only uh, is it a, a good way to absorb the pesticide into your body, but um, it can also physically, your eyes are very delicate and uh, they can be damaged relatively easily with uh, a pesticide exposure. Now, um, oral exposure, um, it's less uh, common than uh, the dermal skin exposure, but it uh, can be much more serious because if it can result in serious poisoning, especially if you're exposed to the concentrate, if during uh, mixing, if you're mixing above your head, pouring into a container and that container were to drop, you could splash and get that into your mouth and it wouldn't be uh, difficult to swallow you know, a mouthful or a tablespoon. And some of these pesticides, uh, that would be uh, enough to make you very, very sick or even kill you. Uh, so this often occurs during mixing. Um, also not washing your hands before eating when uh, an applicator is working with the pesticide and then uh, goes to uh, have their lunch and fails to wash their hands. Or uh, another way is uh, going to use the bathroom without washing hands after working with pesticides. Touching uh, your body, you can absorb through the skin. Also pesticide residues on foods. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about the pesticides residues on foods um, left after harvest in the final presentation on November 12th. So we'll be able to talk about that some as well. Children account for some 50% of accidental poisoning and this usually occurs uh, because of improper storage of pesticides. Uh, children, if uh, left to their own devices, will get into things and they don't know that uh, what's in that bottle is uh, pesticides or something juice and they can accidentally ingest uh, pesticides and because of their smaller body size and their greater susceptibility, uh, poisonings of children are, are quite uh, dangerous with pesticides. The final one that I want to talk about is inhalation and while inhalation is typically the least um, common type of pesticide exposure, it can be the most dangerous. Um, this can occur from breathing the fumes from uh, concentrated pesticides or breathing in an application as, the, uh, as it's being applied. 
uh, this can result in shift from shifting winds, especially if you're if something is being treated in a large field with large scale equipment. If there's a sudden wind change, it would not be uh, difficult to get a lung full of uh, the pesticide. And while it may not be terribly concentrated, the fact that your lungs are so sensitive, uh, the fur you can the the victim can be in a lot of trouble very easily. So on this slide, I'm going to talk about the first aid for inhalation. Uh, I'll talk about the first aid for the other types of exposure in a moment. Uh, with If there's an inhalation uh, exposure, it's important to get the victim to fresh air immediately. Uh, if the victim's not breathing, administer CPR uh, because they're, they're in a very delicate situation. Uh, the, the damage can be done to the lungs quite readily. And then they need to get to medical uh, facility and uh, get uh, medical treatment. Now, pesticides can cause two different types of toxicity, or they're, they're associated with two different types of toxicity. Every chemical, whether it be a pesticide or uh, the, the aspirin, uh, we have an acute toxicity and a chronic toxicity. Acute toxicity is that ability to cause damage from a single exposure. The idea of taking, you know, ingesting a mouthful of pesticide, um, that would cause an immediate effect, possibly uh, nausea, vomiting, uh, nervous system effects, uh, but your body would be working to pass that. Uh, and that is a crisis, but it is an, an immediate response. And, that, and people understand that inherently, and, and that's the one that people typically think about as the danger. The one that people often don't think about and is underestimated the damage is chronic toxicity. The damage arising from small exposures doses over time, long-term effects. And typically these have no uh, relationship to one another. Something that can be acutely toxic um, in one way, affecting your stomach and just general nausea, long-term exposure to smaller doses may affect a completely different organ system like your liver or your nervous system or lead to cancer. Uh, so one doesn't, uh, they don't necessarily predict one another. Now the symptoms of acute exposure, and this uh, can occur whether it be through uh, skin exposure, ingestion, uh, but it, it comes on quickly and the, the symptoms are, can be, dizziness, headache, uh, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting. Uh, this is your body uh, having an immediate reaction and your body trying to get the chemical out, you know, one way or the other, vomiting or out the other. Uh, the effects of it can create massive uh, sweating, uh, drooling, eye-watering, nose running, uh, tremors, uh, pupil dilation, very pinpoint pupils. And um, so it's, it's typically uh, very obvious. Sometimes it can mimic heat stroke, which can be a problem. Um, and if that is uh, the case where uh, wearing a lot of PPE in hot climates, uh, the effects of pesticide exposure can also sometimes look like heat uh, prostration. So it's important to determine what exactly is happening if you see someone having a crisis in the field. But when medical attention is required, if you come upon someone that is in crisis, and let's say they're mixing a pesticide and the jug falls and it drops on them, and they are you know, laying on the ground and there's pesticides spilling right there, your first responsibility is to keep yourself safe. Don't make the situation worse by going in unprotected, and then there's two people that are in danger. So. If there's a, a crisis like that, make sure you're wearing the correct per, per personal protective equipment and then go in and get the person away from the exposure source. Worry about the cleanup after, you know, the most important thing now is that victim. If uh, they are, have, it's a contamination event, with their clothes, get them out of those clothes, um, decontaminate them if necessary. Uh, if they've ingested the pesticide, uh, induce vomiting, but only if the label directs. There's some uh, pesticides where 
uh, the label will direct you that if ingested, do not induce vomiting because that can actually make uh, the situation worse. People can vomit the pesticide back up and because of the, the nature of the pesticide, it can get into the lungs and uh, then you have, not, you have a, a worse problem. Uh, so decontaminate the victim if necessary and then get the person to medical facility. And when you take them to the hospital, you wanna ensure that you bring the pesticide container and the label uh, so that the doctor knows what they were exposed to and what they uh, can be, how, how to treat them. Now, as I mentioned earlier, when you're exposed, uh, if you ingest a, or a, an acute exposure, your body is trying to get rid of that, that pesticide. And our bodies do detoxify pesticides to some degree. Our metabolism breaks them down uh, in the liver, uh, we eliminate them through urine, sweat, feces, exhalation. Uh, so many pesticide exposures, acute exposures, uh, people can fully recover from, and uh, there are no uh, long-term ill effects. The problem is, is that some pesticides get stored in the body, particularly in fat cells, and these can lead to long-term chronic problems, uh, causing uh, reproductive harm, uh, cancer, and things like that. And that's the real danger. That's one of the real dangers and overlooked dangers uh, with pesticides is that chronic health issues. Um, chronic exposure is not readily apparent. It may occur as a result of uh, pesticide use over decades of exposure, but then lead to respiratory complications, liver, heart, nervous system diseases, uh, even to cancer and reproductive harm, where uh, things that were, you were exposed to years ago are now causing problems for you and your family. And uh, we need to consider that in long-term planning with uh, pesticides. Now, I wanna shift a little bit to talking about how pesticide exposures can affect our environment. Um, and the misuse of pesticides can cause all kinds of problems in our environment, but Immediately, if you're not using pesticides properly, you can damage your crops and you can make things worse. If you don't, um, if you misuse or overuse a pesticide, you can cause phytotoxicity, which is going to cause a yield loss in your crops. And this is all the more reason to use an integrated pest management approach. If you are accurately identifying your pest problem and then finding the pesticide to treat it properly, with using only the amount that you need, the following the label guidelines, the risk to uh, crop damage, causing crop damage is minimized. The other way that pesticide misuse can uh, cause problems is that it can bring more pests in through pesticide resistance. If farmers aren't identifying their pests properly, and then using the correct pesticides in the correct rotation, they can select for pesticide resistance. And how that works is in every pest population, you will have some level of resistance. And if you make an application, the susceptible, uh, in this case, insects die and leave the resistant individuals, they can reproduce and over time, they will predominate in the population and further pesticide uh, applications of the same pesticide may be uh, less effective or completely ineffective. And this is why it's important to uh, time, identify your pests properly, time your application correctly, and then rotate your pesticides so that you avoid creating resistant pests. Another way that uh, pesticide misuse can bring more pests is by harming beneficial insects and uh, other arthropods. Uh, if you make a pesticide application that, to control one pest, uh, let's say aphids, um, and, but that also kills your predators, your uh, ladybug larvae, your spiders, and things like that, you might have a resurgence of a secondary pest because now those beneficials aren't there to eat the, the secondary pest that pops up. And this is again, another reason to use IPM to understand what pesticides you can use to minimize the harm to your uh, 
biological beneficial control measures. Now, pesticides can pollute our environment. And this is, again, sometimes things that are overlooked because farmers have their immediate uh, needs. They want their crop to, uh, they're feeding their families and uh, hopefully making a profit with their produce. And so sometimes the environment can be overlooked. And this uh, pollution of the environment can occur throughout the, the process of handling pesticides. It can poison soil, water, air, during mixing, during application, during storage and disposal. All of this, all of the pesticides go somewhere. And often that's through the ground and to the water. Your pesticide misuse can harm your livestock. Uh, if that is, if your pesticides are seeping into the water uh, that they drink, it can make them sick. Uh, and if that's getting into well water, it can make your family sick. Uh, we have to remind farmers, even at whatever level they're working, we all share the same water. And whether they're making an application to a field where they're uh, disposing of uh, their garbage and pesticide uh, waste, uh, cities, uh, factories, everything uh, has the potential to wait, making its way to the water source. And then that can make that in, into our uh, system. And this, if it gets into wells, it can get into uh, our drinking water and get back into us. And so by protecting our environment long term, you're protecting uh, your family. And I try to emphasize that message when I'm talking to farmers. Now, the goal of any uh, pesticide safety program is keeping the applicator and the environment safe by minimizing uh, the exposure risks. Now, I'm gonna open this up to uh, discussion about uh, what we covered thus far. We're gonna take uh, a little time to answer your questions and then uh, we can go into the next uh, lecture. Again, this is just how to ask questions. I'm going to exit my screen and hopefully uh, come up on camera, good. And so, um, do we have any questions? Thank you very much, uh, Tim, for this uh, uh, presentation this far. And I think those issues related to the human health aspects, but then also environmental aspects are really important. And uh, while uh, everyone, so please either raise your hand or type your question in the chat box, and I will then relay it to Tim. And maybe while others are waiting, I had a couple of questions I would like to ask. Absolutely. So you talked about the resistance, the development of resistance as a uh, result of misuse of pesticide. And I realized that uh, uh, there's probably quite a range in terms of the time when one can see such resistance developing. But could you talk a little bit about how long would take, uh, you know, with perhaps particular pesticides or particular situations or particularly level of misuse? Well, um, I can speak to the different insects, for example, can uh, develop resistance at uh, much different rates. Aphids seem to uh, be able to develop resistance fairly quickly. Uh, it's because of their the the way they reproduce um, because they they reproduce asexually some of them reproduce asexually uh, that if you knock out um, a susceptible population and you have just a couple resistant individuals uh, because they reproduce asexually you can get very large populations of resistant individuals in the next uh, within the next few months. The level of resistance may increase over time, um, but you can select for resistant aphids fairly quickly. In terms of other pests um, and with different uh, pesticides, there, there are different rates. Um, I'm not specifically familiar with uh, pesticides 
types of pesticides and how they cause resistance. Uh, Dr. Muniapan may be able to speak to that in terms of the, the, the pace of resistance selection. Muni? Okay. Yeah, Tim, in the, in the case of Paul Amibom, you know, resistant development has been noted in different countries, especially in South America. It also depends upon what kind of pesticides they use and if they, you know, mix up the molecules, say from chlorinated hydrocarbons to the other uh, chemical groups, then the resistance may, be, may break down. But if they keep on using uh, one type of molecule or group of molecules, the resistance development is faster. Good. Thank, thank you very much for that. Uh, Tim, did you have something else? No, no, it, it's fine. Thank you, yes, yeah. And uh, also you did mention that, you know, pesticides can also just harm the beneficial insects that are there and are important obviously for the ecosystem, but they also for agricultural crops in some cases. So are there particular kinds of pesticides that we should be particularly uh, cognizant about in terms of their harmful impacts on uh, beneficial insects or particular types of situations in terms of pesticide application or other conditions or, uh, where we really need to be thinking that, well, this type of application, this type of situation can really lead to a situation where the harmful insects uh, will be them, will be harmed. I'm sorry, where the beneficial insects will be harmed. Yes, um, yes, I understand your question. Um, yes, particularly, uh, I can speak to the, the pollinators uh, immediately. Um, they are very susceptible to the, the nerve toxins like uh, pyrethroids and neonicotinoids, um, and those will harm uh, the, the, the pollinators, which are a certain type of uh, beneficials. Uh, the other, and those, those also will, will harm the, uh, the predators, the uh, spiders and, and beetle uh, predators. Um, the, Types of pesticides and, and, and timing of, of when you use those can affect it as well. Um, if you're applying uh, pesticides, the pyrethroids uh, during bloom or at the, the, the heat of the day, where those pollinators are flying and when they're most active, that's where they're most in danger. Uh, other pesticides that can be used to minimize the harm to beneficials like the predator insects are things. Uh, like the biologicals. They are often um, targeted to the pest directly. Things that uh, have BT in them are, are often targeted to uh, caterpillar pests um, and have virtually no effect on uh, the predators. Um, and also there's other uh, types of biological pesticides that uh, seem to be far less harmful to uh, the beneficials because they have to be ingested by the plant sucking pest or a chewing pest, whereas the uh, beneficial predators are running across the top of the leaves uh, and attacking the insects themselves. So they're not picking up the residues. Okay. Thank you very much for that. And uh, I am not seeing any questions in the chat box right now. So this, I think there will be another question and answer session later. So you feel free to, to, to ask uh, questions then also. But if you do have now a question, please raise your hand or, or type it in the chat box. I think the presentation was so clear that everybody is okay. So uh, uh, maybe we can continue. Then. Yeah. That's that's very kind. That that's always uh, that's always a presenter's uh, question. It, was it so clear, or have they already dozed off? Uh, it was it was so clear. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
<laughs> okay, I'll reshare my screen and go into the second uh, uh, presentation. And I just want to do this real quick. Okay, all right, there and there. Okay, now the second uh, part of the, the presentation, I want to talk uh, about how to minimize uh, exposure to pesticides in the different aspects of uh, the, the pesticide use chain. And that's reducing pesticide exposure uh, to the applicator. Now, again, I talk to my, uh, the farmers and the ones that are working in the field and empower them that they have a lot of power to reduce their own exposure risk throughout the entire uh, cycle of the pesticide use, whether that be in deciding what pesticide to use, where and how to purchase it, mixing and loading the application, cleanup and storage and disposal. And that pesticide safety starts with selecting and purchasing the correct pesticide. Again, this reinforces the, the uh, tenants of IPM to know what pest you're dealing with so that you can purchase what you need. The last thing you want to do is go to an agro vet and describe your pest problem inaccurately and be sold something that isn't going to solve your problem because then you've wasted your time, your money, and your crop is still being damaged by this other pest and you may have just made things worse. Um, I point people uh, to the USAID's Pursue Ops um, for guidance as to what pesticides to use for their given problems. Uh, it lists, the, the Pursue Ops are actually really interesting are, uh, documents, um, but they list, one of the things that it does is it lists uh, the pesticides uh, that are approved for use under the, uh, the Pursue Op so that you can look and see what the active ingredient is, uh, what the risk associated with it is by the World Health Organization, uh, some and some description about it. Um, so when you know what your pest is and what pesticide you want to purchase, then you want to purchase it from a reputable agrovet dealer in sealed and labeled uh, containers so that you know exactly what you're getting. Now, you want containers that are uh, unbroken, undamaged, have the, uh, all the labeling associated with them, have the warning symbols on them so that you know what you're buying. You never want to buy repackaged uh, pesticides. Uh, with a, a repackaged pesticide, you don't know what you're getting. You don't know what the product actually may be. You don't know the expiry date on them and you don't know what the hazards are. You may be given some labeling with that that may or may not go with that product, and you may be exposing yourself to undue risk and uh, your, your crops and your, your family. So my recommendation is to not buy repackaged pesticides, even though I know it's a temptation for many rural farmers because they want to buy as little as possible, as little as they need, just what they need. Um, but it's, it's a recipe for disaster. Now, when you select the pesticide and you have your uh, pesticide in its sealed, unbroken container, and then you have the uh, label, it's important that you understand the World Health Organization label guidelines and the manufacturer's claims. Um, this is an area where extension uh, personnel and the agro vets can help you understand what's on the label. And labels are not easy to read. And I, I like to tell farmers when I talk to them, you know, don't you know, acknowledge that. It's not easy to read a label. It's a lot of information. Oftentimes it may not be in, in your home language. Um, and it's got a lot of information on there. The information on a pesticide label is going to contain everything from what it is and what's in it and who manufactured it. But then you get into the really important stuff. If there's a restricted use statement, this will be a statement that declares that this pesticide has specific risks 
to either the, the environment or a, a bird species or something like that. So uh, you get specific information about what this is a hazard to. The signal word will be on the uh, label, including the symbol, and you need to recognize that. That's an indication of how acutely toxic the concentrate itself is. This isn't a measure of how dangerous the final mixed product is. This is talking about the, what's in that bottle, the concentrate itself. Now what uh, the farmer may be most interested in is the directions for use and when the crops can be harvested. And that's important, that's vital information, but all of this other stuff is very important too. Uh, there's precautionary statements about what the hazards are and how to avoid them. Um, first aid, treatment, statements of practical treatment, that if you're exposed to this pesticide, what you can do and how you should inform the, the medical staff if you're uh, exposed. Specific environmental hazards. Some pesticides will say this is a particular hazard to fish and to you're not allowed to uh, apply it within a hundred feet of a uh, water source. Uh, it will talk about the physical or chemical hazards of the product itself. If you know the product has, if it may be corrosive or hazardous to um, your eyes or uh, cause skin irritation, it will tell you what personal protective equipment is required uh, for both mixing and applying, and then it will tell you how to store and dispose of the product. Now it's important to know what these symbols mean and their different severity. These are developed by the World Health Organization to draw your attention to how severely dangerous a given pesticide concentrate is. And this goes, it, the, the scale goes from very toxic to toxic, harmful, caution, and then uh, this green label, it's unlikely to present a hazard under normal use conditions. Now these uh, signal words are accompanied by uh, color symbols and hazard symbols. These pesticides up here that are considered very toxic and toxic, the ones that are going to get the red color band and the skull and crossbones, it takes a very little amount of the concentrate to make you very sick or possibly even kill you. We're talking about a uh, just a tablespoon or a few mill, milliliters of the uh, pesticide ingested, and that's what they're worried about. They're worried that if you're mixing this, you drop the bottle, it pops in your face, you swallow some, and that is enough to make you very sick or die. As the, uh, the pesticides with the harmful and slightly hazardous, it takes more and more of the product to make you sick, and it becomes a, it becomes less likely that you're going to accidentally ingest that. You know, with uh, some of these, whereas these, you might be talking about an ounce that could make you sick or kill you. Down here, you're talking about pints to many pints to quarts to something that you would have to drink a volume, you know, like an entire large amount of liquid. And that mm -hmm. gets into the realm of intentional poisoning, which happens, but you know, we can only mitigate for so many uh, risks, and we're looking at accidental exposure. Now, I, farmers should be looking at other warning labels, and this is something that I think uh, label manufacturers are doing better. They're, they're putting more visible uh, pictographic symbols on labels, so it doesn't require uh, reading in the, the language of the label to understand some of the risks. You'll see things about storage, uh, what personal protective equipment to wear when mixing and handling the concentrate, uh, how harmful uh, the product is. This would be a yellow band. Uh, what type of pe uh, personal protective equipment to use uh, when applying the pesticide, and then uh, the recommendation to wash after use. And there's other symbols that, that indicate that you know don't smoke or eat while applying. That's uh, should be common with all pesticides. Uh, so look for these warning labels. And I go back to uh, the Pursua because this is a excellent source of information uh, for the agrovet, for the extension person, 
and for the educator and the farmer if they have access to it. Uh, it will list, in many cases, it will list the active ingredient, an example of uh, that trade name in the, the host country, uh, the toxicity of the, the pesticide, either or sometimes both from the EPA uh, designation and the World Health Organization uh, designation. It will often list the pre-harvest interval, which is the, the time that you have to wait before going into the field to harvest after you apply the pesticide. With some of these uh, pesticides, the more modern biologicals, you can apply them up till the last day of harvest and harvest them that same day, which is great. Um, the, there will be some statement about what kind of uh, toxicity this product has, how it's acutely or chronically toxic to uh, humans, how it can affect the environment. Uh, we'll often have other comments about what crops it can and can't be used on and uh, local uh, country uh, warnings about certain things. And then what I like about this particular Pursue Up, it uh, ranks the, the toxicity for both humans and eco toxicity, environmental toxicity, so that you can kind of quickly look at this chart of pesticides and know that these are generally low toxic to both humans and uh, the environment. By contrast, uh, the, the Pursue Op will also list uh, much more dangerous pesticides uh, that some are restricted use, this RUP, that uh, will have specific restrictions on why it's uh, dangerous, that you know, it may, uh, as I said earlier, be a, a particular threat to birds or fish. Um, Again, it will have the, uh, the toxicity warnings. And here, notice the pre-harvest interval, it's up to 21 days. And that means that after you apply that pesticide, you need to wait long enough for the pesticide to be um, burned off, basically, by the, the sun and detoxified by the plant so that the, the plant is safe to harvest. Likewise, in the ranking system, you'll see the, uh, that these are ranked in color and uh, with words of more uh, dangerous so that you can easily look at it and see what pesticides are uh, more hazardous. Now, mixing pesticides is a primary cause of exposure for the, the applicator. And I know that uh, we would all uh, love to see uh, people when they're mixing pesticide concentrates to be wearing all the personal protective equipment, you know, gloves, coveralls, eye protection, uh, masks. I have no doubt that he's wearing boots, and that would be wonderful. But of course, we understand that that isn't practical in many situations. And in rural areas, we often have uh, people hand mixing pesticides uh, just before using them, and this can be devastating because you're 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 working with the concentrate and you're absorbing that uh, right then. Um, Mixing and loading of the pesticides accounts for about 85% of the exposure uh, is to the hands and arms. So where you, and, and this isn't just with hand mixing, this is in general. If you're mixing pesticides, even uh, you know, pouring concentrate into something, most of the exposure is going to happen on your forearms and, and hands. Um, and this is an example of just how badly damaged the skin can, can become. Uh, now, this uh, risk can be reduced by some 99% simply by wearing chemically resistant gloves and long sleeve shirts. Now, ideally, uh, for even the most minimally toxic uh, pesticides, when handling the concentrate, the minimum amount of uh, protective gear is specified should be waterproof gloves, long sleeve shirts, long pants, shoes, and socks. Um, now, again, that is the ideal, but we understand the reality. If, if applicators could just increase glove use, pesticide exposures could be reduced dramatically. And that's why when I talk to uh, folks in uh, rural areas, I, I encourage if, their aim, if we can increase the glove use in your farmers, uh, this could make a big difference in keeping them safer. Um, 
I recommend a butyl or a neoprene glove, uh, something that's heavy duty enough to hold up for long term use and then be dedicated to just mixing um, and loading when they're working with the concentrate and then washing those and then storing them out of the sun and so they can be protected. And you can get a, a year of, of use out of these, even in harsh conditions, if they're cleaned and stored properly, these uh, gloves will hold up and protect uh, the applicator, protect the applicator, excuse me. Now, if during mixing an exposure occurs uh, where the applicator spills pesticide, the concentrate, onto their bodies, uh, it's recommended that you immediately remove the contaminated clothes because if you think about it, that cloth is holding the pesticide in contact with your skin for a longer period of time and causing greater exposure risk. So remove the contaminated clothes, wash the exposed skin uh, thoroughly, um, and then monitor yourself, or if it's another person, watch them for symptoms of acute toxicity. It may be that they are, you know, they, they become a little bit sick, but if you get that off of them quickly, they may not need medical attention. If they do, make sure you get them to the doctor. Um, after the fact, when the, the person or you, if it's your exposure, when you're okay, then you can go and dispose of the contaminated clothing. Um, typically, especially if you're dealing with emulsifiable concentrates, uh, things that have a solvent in them, getting them out of clothing can be very difficult, and it uh, may be best just to uh, discard the clothing. Um, so, now when you're mixing, I recommend that you create a dedicated mixing area. And uh, this, while this may immediately seem like it may not be practical, um, a dedicated mixing area doesn't have to be elaborate. While it could be a poured concrete slab, that would probably be ideal. Um, it could be a gravel uh, area. Um, but if it's a poured slab or, or whatever, wherever the area is, you want to build it away from uh, water sources and where children are going to be uh, playing and, and being around. Um, and while it can be something elaborate as a poured concrete slab, in small use areas where you're mixing up backpack sprayers or uh, handheld mixers, it could be as simple as a uh, plastic or even wooden pan. Uh, wood is not ideal, obviously, but it's better than nothing. And if you can, the idea is to contain a spill so that it doesn't get go anywhere else and make things worse. So if you have a dedicated mixing area, here's an example of a concrete pad, and then you do all of your mixing on the pad. And note, this man is, uh, he's mixing below his waist. Uh, so the, the likelihood, even if he drops, the, if this is the concentrate, let's say, and he were to drop this, the likelihood that it's going to splash up into his face is lower, as opposed to if you were pouring something over your head. So if you're doing all of your mixing on a dedicated uh, area, if there's a spill, um, it can reduce soil exposure. And the nice thing is you can leave that in the sun and let those cleansing rays of the sun break down the pesticide residues. And that's, that's one of the ways we break down pesticides. Now, another thing that I wanna talk about in conducting, uh, when you're doing mixing preparation, it's important to conduct what's called a jar test for compatibility. And what this is, is uh, just like it sounds, um, you take a jar like this, um, and mix your ingredients in the proportions uh, that you would in your tank mix. Um, and then mix them up in here and uh, see if there's a problem. Uh, your label may permit mixing and it will state, uh, typically labels will state what you're not allowed to mix. Say that, that this chemical can't be mixed with this because it causes problems. And some of the problems that it may cause is uh, physical incompatibilities, where you'll get separation of the two uh, pesticides, they'll um, get clumping, uh, fall out of solution. Um, other chemical incompatibilities 
Uh, other things are chemical incompatibilities, where you actually have a reaction between the two pesticides, where there might be a color change, there might it might foam, it might uh, generate heat, you know, and that is a problem. Um, but it's better to see those results in a jar rather than in your backpack sprayer or uh, tank sprayer and risk damaging your equipment and working with a larger scale of pesticides that you then have to deal with the disposal of. Now, when you, if let's say you mix uh, several different pesticides together, it, it all looks fine in your jar test, then you're ready to mix your pesticides uh, to do your application. Um, there's a proper mixing order that you should follow. First off, wear all of your, uh, the required personal protective equipment. Uh, then you want to fill your tank, whether it be a backpack sprayer or a larger tank, uh, fill it a fifth to one half full uh, with carrier. That's typically water or sometimes liquid fertilizer. And then you want to follow what's called the whale method. Uh, the, uh, and that's the order in which you mix things. Uh, the W is for wettable powders and dry formulations. So things like uh, dry flowables, water dispersible granules. You wanna put those in first and then agitate. These are the things that take the most time to go into solution. And so you really wanna give them the most time to agitate, get them mixed up. Once those are adequately mixed, then you can add your liquid formulations like your solutions and your soluble powders, things that will actually go into solution. Um, and at that point, you would add any of your surfactants or uh, adjuvants the, to help uh, with the uh, application. And lastly, you want to add your emulsion products. Emulsions, if, if you add your emulsions too uh, soon uh, when you're adding your wettable powders, oftentimes they'll uh, mix together and clump. So you want to make sure everything's mixed in and in liquid form before you add your emulsifiable concentrates. Lastly, you would add the component of your jar test because you've already got that mixed up. Um, and then rinse your pesticide, your bottles, your pet. If, if you've used the entire concentrate, you can rinse that container and pour that into your backpack sprayer um, and also rinse the jar and so that rinse aid is going into your, your mix, and then you don't have to worry about it. You have clean uh, containers, and you're ready to go uh, do your application. Now, rinsing pesticide containers, uh, they should be triple rinsed. Uh, the larger ones, uh, like this, uh, what that means is when they're completely empty, you've drained all the pesticide out, fill them with about a quarter uh, way with water, cap that, shake it vigorously, and then pour that water into uh, some, something that you're going to use at, in the pesticide application, ideally uh, your uh, spray rig. And then do that two more times. So that's triple rinsing uh, to clean out all uh, the majority of the pesticide residues. Um, and then you need to take the next step and destroy that container. You want to make these pesticide containers un so they can't be reused. For the smaller ones, you can crush them, cut them up. The larger ones, it's important to cut holes in them. And I, I understand that this is a difficult thing to convince farmers to do in uh, developing countries because that's a big, hard plastic, useful bottle. Um, but it's important that we don't uh, you reuse these for anything uh, for storing water and especially not storing oils because while you may be able to rinse uh, water out uh, or rinse the pesticide out with water if you were to store oil in that uh, like cooking oil that oil can actually continue to leach pesticides out of the uh, the plastic and into the oil and uh, make people sick so please encourage people not to reuse them now, when you're done mixing, you need to clean up your mixing area. And again, if this is a dedicated mixing area, it makes things more easy. Uh, clean up any spills that may have occurred. If you uh, use rags to clean that up, uh, you need to uh, co collect those uh, contaminated rags to dispose of them. Then you want to wash and rinse your gloves uh, 
and allow them to dry and then store them out of the sun because the sun will break down that rubber. And then the sun is your best friend in breaking down pesticide residues. Don't let it, don't uh, keep your gloves safe, but let your mixing area be exposed to the sun because that's going to break down those uh, pesticide residues. Now, again, the goal uh, is to keep your country safe, keep the applicators safe, and uh, keep uh, by reducing the, the exposures. Now, what we're gonna be talking about uh, in the November 12th session is going to be how applicators can reduce their exposures during application. I'm gonna talk some about nozzle selection and uh, maintenance of equipment. Uh, why re-entry intervals are important uh, after the application is made to the field uh, and what pre-harvest intervals are. Uh, cleanup after application uh, and spill cleanup, which is very important. How to safely store and dispose of pesticides. And then this final topic, I want to talk about understanding pesticide residues on foods. I think that's an overlooked area where uh, Pesticides are, are still on the foods that we eat, and uh, we need to be aware of them. So I'm going to open it up again to discussion about reducing exposures uh, during selection and mixing. If you have any other questions about things that we shared, I invite your questions for that as well. And again, just remember, it's a small enough group, I'm sure. If you haven't typed your questions already, you, are, you can, or you can ask them verbally. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to present. And we're back. Thank you very much, uh, Tim. And um, <clears throat> as I am currently not seeing any raised hands, so I will be giving some time for everybody to think about questions. And I have a few questions lined up here for you but I will stop uh, my questions if uh, someone else has one. So, Absolutely. you know, one of the important issues that you talked about was the expiry, expiry date of the pesticides. Yes. And uh, does that have to do only with the kind of the effectiveness of the pesticide? So for example, if it is, let's say a half of year past its expiry date, that most likely it just will be less effective, or does it also, does a pesticide that is past its expiry date, might it also be more uh, dangerous? Yes, uh, it's, it's a little of both. The expiry date encompasses both um, claims that the, manu the manufacturer uh, wants this product used by the expiry date because they have confidence that it will be the most effective. Um, but with some pesticides, um, especially things like um, in, emulsifiable concentrates, um, they can, when they're past their expiry date, they may not only be less effective, but they may have changed in ways that make them more uh, dangerous. If you've got significant separation um, of the emulsifiable concentrates and the they may be completely ineffective because the, uh, the way ECs can separate is the solids can actually bind up your uh, pesticides. And then that emulsifier, the, the, the solvent, uh, can actually be in more concentrated form when you uh, put it into your mix. So getting that on your skin can be more hazardous because you're getting a relatively larger dose of the uh, emulsifier because it's not properly mixed. Likewise, if you mix up that, if you dump that, mix that up, and there's more emulsifier in your uh, spray, um, you may be causing extreme phytotoxicity uh, and burn because that uh, solvent can stay on the plant and then make it uh, just burn it from the sun. So. Uh, Thank you very much for that. And I see that Joyce has a question. Joyce, please go ahead. Uh, hi, Tim. And hi, Ego. Um, I mean, my concern is on the smallholder farmers that have uh, gardens on the banks of um, water sources. 
is there a way we can help in reducing the seepage of the pesticide into the water source because they can they can't afford to maintain the recommended distance because they have to water their gardens manually and they have to draw water from the stream and then water their garden so they may not be able to maintain the recommended distance so is there anything we can do to reduce the seepage of the pesticides into the water source yes what you can do is by um timing the ensuring that they're they're not watering too close to when they're applying the pesticides. So if they, if they know that they have to make a, a pesticide application and uh, you know, do water, water the, the plant first um, and then make the application and then wait a, a day, a couple of days uh, and risk you know, the, the plant being a little water uh, stressed, but it allows the pesticide longer time to stay on the plant and break down so that they're not then uh, washing it away. It, it just gives a chance to break down. Uh, that would be one way uh, through timing. Um, and then another is using um, a low drift uh, application nozzle or some kind of adjuvant that would help it stick to the plant better rather than uh, spraying to the point of running off and into the soil. Good, thank you. And Tracy's question came from Zambia, by the way. So, and will we be seeing in the next, uh, uh, your next, uh, in the part two, will we be seeing the load drift uh, application? So we all know what that looks like. The, uh, could you repeat that? The what? You mentioned about the particular applicator uh, and Will we be seeing a photo of that in the next part yes. of your training so that yeah. we all know how it looks? Yes, That's absolutely. Great. Yes. Thank you. I think I'm not seeing any other questions. So while you, all the participants are thinking uh, about other questions, I will ask uh, you a second question. And that has to do with the pre-harvest interval. You know, the the time between the pesticide application and when crops can be safely harvested. So if we think about that, and of course this is a big problem in many countries in Southern Africa, uh, you, know, the, you know, the limited knowledge of this, or then, you know, farmers feeling that they just have to do that application and they have to market their crops on a particular day. Yep. So, uh, how does the kind of the reduction of pesticides in those crops look like between the pesticide application and up to the time of the harvest? So are we looking at, in most instances, kind of a linear reduction of the pesticides in the harvestable portions of the crops? Or does it depend a lot on the pesticide? Does it depend a lot on the crop itself? Does it depend a lot on the weather uh, or other factors? That, that's a good question. And, um, I, and this is a bit of conjecture, but I think that the, the, it's going to be a fairly linear degradation. Uh, what you have would be um, a big spike right post application and it would drop off uh, probably a fair bit uh, in the first day. It probably has a peak that uh, at the first day it, it degrades a certain amount and then over the next several days or however long the, uh, the post-harvest interval is, it probably then goes in a fairly linear fashion down. Um, my suspicion is that uh, the application, it's initially, you know, hours after application, it's on the plant, it's still wet. Once it's dry, it's less available. Um, and then it's absorbed by the plant, it's much less available. And then you're dealing with uh, just the degradation from environmental factors, uh, sunlight, uh, wind, water uh, degradation and microbial degradation. Um, and so I would suspect that that's a fairly linear process. Um, 
generally, you know, a, a rain is going to accelerate that, but um, I'm not, I, I don't recommend messing with the label recommendations of uh, post-harvest intervals, you know, even, even if you get a rain right after you uh, treat, I, I'd still recommend following that post-harvest, the, the PHI. Exactly, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And uh, I am not seeing any hands raised and I don't, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat box. So maybe if I can just ask you a couple of other questions. Please do. Would you mind? Not okay. at all. Good. So, you know, one issue, you did talk a lot about the kind of the different levels of hazard. Uh, uh, in the pesticides, you know, the, the dangers that they pose to human health and environmental health. Um, you know, often people think that the so-called natural pesticides are without any risks. And, uh, you know, I'm very happy that, like, for example, in our work, we do need to, you know, consider this, them the same way we have to do this. Uh, the, all the preparations required by Persua. But uh, would you like to talk a little bit about the, the dangers that so-called natural pesticides can pose and uh, yes. the types of pesticides that we have that are considered, now, that are natural products, yes. but are used as pesticides? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm Mariana, thank you for bringing that up. Um, and when you said natural, you know, I smiled because it, it people do uh, tend to attribute more safety to things that they consider as natural pesticides. Uh, and in some instances, they're correct and they are safer, but not necessarily. Um, neem is a uh, very common, uh, quote, natural pesticide. It's being extracted. Um, uh, from a tree um, and and it can be safely handled but it can also uh, be hazardous in the right concentrations and we shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that just because something is quote natural it's not going to harm us you know think about um, you can make a, uh, a pesticide a natural pesticide from soaking tobacco leaves um, and that extracts the nicotine into the water, and that's a natural pesticide. And you uh, absorb enough through that, of that through your skin, you'll die. It's a very toxic solution. So um, it's, it's unfortunate that we have, uh, that synthetic chemicals uh, manufacturers have done such a poor job of adequately uh, explaining that just because it's natural doesn't mean it's safe and just because it's synthetic doesn't mean it's dangerous. So um, there are some, uh, you know, I would much rather use some of the, there's a few of the, the synthetic pesticides that I, I think would be, um, you know, I wouldn't have any problem using uh, on, my, on my pets. You know, we put those spot-ons on our pets uh, for, for flea control and that's a, that's a synthetic pesticide and it's quite well tolerated. So. Good, thank you for that. And uh, another issue that, you know, I was really interested in hearing about was the mixing of the pesticides. And, uh, you know, I know that this is also a practice in Southern Africa. And uh, we have seen that and, you know, discussed it even within our project. Um, I had a couple of questions in regards to it. I would be personally quite concerned that the dilution would not be properly done if you are doing the mixing of the pesticides. So a farmer, a smallholder farmer might just be kind of using one way to dilute pesticides that might have to be diluted in very different ways. I don't know if you have any comments about that. And then, and then uh, you also discussed these uh, emulsifiable concentrates. Mm -hmm. Could you just uh, 
let us know how do we know that a pesticide is an emulsifiable concentrate. And, you know, in this kind of addition of different pesticides that might be mixed together, those would be the ones that will be going in last. Yeah, um, I'll answer the, the second question first. Uh, the emulsifiable concentrate will um, show on the label, it will be an EC, that's its symbol, with the, the different pesticide classes, uh, they have the symbol on there um, to indicate what type of formulation they are. Um, the emulsifiable concentrates, um, they're, they're wonderful products to use if you can find the right one because they go into solution very nicely. They stay in solution, uh, so you don't need agitation to keep them in solution or very little agitation. Um, they um, can do damage uh, to uh, rubber fittings on your uh, mix or your, uh, your application equipment. So that is, that is a downside, but it isn't, it's not abrasive at all. And that's something with like wettable powders. Uh, they can be rather abrasive and break down your nozzles, whereas emulsifiable concentrates won't do that. Um, they don't leave a visible residue on uh, leaves. One of the downsides of emulsifiable concentrates though is because of the emulsifier in there, it makes uh, burning of the crop more likely. Um, because it's the emulsifier is some kind of solvent, so it's uh, you know some oftentimes a petroleum distillate, and uh, you can imagine that a plant can only tolerate so much of that on its leaves, and especially if it's wet and it's sunny. A lot of ECs will be recommended that you apply when the sun is not intense in the morning or in the evening, so that the the uh, pesticide can absorb properly and then it's not uh, exposed to the sunlight. Now to your other question about the concern about dilution factor, that really shouldn't be a problem if the uh, label directions are followed for each of the component uh, uh, pesticides. Let's say um, you are supposed to mix, um, just to keep it simple, one pesticide is two ounces per gallon and another pesticide is five ounces per gallon. You can put those, what amounts to seven ounces of uh, chemical into the gallon of water and it will change the concentration slightly because you're not diluting the, the two ounces across a gallon of um, water. You're now uh, diluting it across, it's a larger volume. But the, the difference in concentration is going to be minuscule. And um, the, the chemical manufacturers take this into account and the, it's permissible. Um, when you have uh, pesticides that are either chemically incompatible with each other or the application rate is so specific for a given chemical, um, then you might have restrictions on the label that you know says do not mix this product with anything else or do not mix it with this particular pesticide because of known incompatibilities. Good, thank you very much. And I think those kinds of complexities are then ones where which can make maybe that practice for many farmers uh, difficult because it does go into then, you know, trying to review, you know, which ones go together, you know, what are those dilutions, etc. Yeah, and, and often with smallholder farmers, uh, there may not be a need for a lot of uh, multi-mix uh, products. Uh, if, they're, if they're applying to a, a garden or a small field and they're doing um, backpack sprayer or things like that, it, they may be using the same sprayer for multiple different pesticides. Uh, but they may just not have the need to to apply multiple things at once. So it may not it may not be a thing that uh, is really necessary. Good. Thank you very much for that. And I am not seeing any questions anymore. So I think again, Tim, it was a very clear presentation. Well, it you. was one we all learned a lot from it. And. Uh, 
I think for now then we will be just looking forward to the next uh, presentation right. on November 12th and I hope uh, all of the ones who were participating today can participate and please also uh, inform your partners and inform you know beneficiaries about this for the ones who do have access to internet that uh, there's a lot to learn uh, from these presentations. Uh, as you see, we have been recording this presentation and we will be making it available to everyone. I assume uh, anyone who might have an issue with that, uh, and it really has to do mainly with just seeing your name in that, uh, that your name might be uh, in that uh, recording. Uh, please let us know, otherwise we assume that uh, it has been fine for us to have this recording and uh, post it on different websites so that we can spread the message about safe uh, pesticide use. So again, thank you very much, Tim. Thank you for all of you for participating. And over to you, Tim, for the final words. Yes, I just want to thank you all for participating and uh, echo Mariotta's uh, statement. Tell your friends, uh, come back for the November 12th uh, conversation, and uh, I look forward to your questions and interacting with you then. Um, one of the things that is a personal interest to me in uh, developing countries is the, the problem with disposal of uh, pesticide containers and um, the the preventing reuse of them. Uh, so I would be very. I'm looking very much forward to talking to you and asking you questions about the state of disposal in your countries and what suggestions you might have for solving that problem. Because I think that it's one of the. I think that we're looking at a time bomb of uh, pesticide uh, pollution that is because things aren't getting properly disposed of. And uh, so I want to talk to you about that. So I'll be looking forward to your feedback. So again, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mariotta, for uh, hosting this and uh, Mooney for making uh, this possible as well. And I'll see you next time. Thank you.